I won't spit. I won't spit, I won't I won't spit, spit on you, Marv. <laughs> And Lord, we do have something to celebrate. You love us. Lord, I think all of us here feel pretty fortunate that we answered that drawing that you gave to us many years ago or perhaps recently. When we felt like we needed a Savior, when we needed help, when we realized that sin was too big for us, we just couldn't help ourselves any longer. We needed someone greater, someone better, someone more equipped to handle uh, our situations. And Lord, you have redeemed us. You have bought us by your blood, and we are so thankful. It, it just never, ever gets old. So we, so we love you tonight. We pray, we pray Lord, Lord, that, Lord, that uh, as, we as we look at your scripture, Lord, Lord it, it, tells it tells us it's a light, it's a lamp. It's a lamp. Lord, it Lord, it tells us that it's powerful. It's sharp. It's sharp. Sometimes, Sometimes it cuts deep. And it cuts, and it cuts uh, in, areas in areas where it feels good and sometimes it doesn't. And uh, But we appreciate it, Lord, because it helps to expose the flesh. And to, and to deal with those, with those issues, issues in our life, life that sometimes we don't want to face, but we can't deny because your word is pointing it out. It out. No, one no one else is, Lord, and we just see in your word, in your word areas, things, where areas where we need to change, areas, areas to affirm, affirm where, we're where we're at with you. And, uh, and uh, so, again, Lord, again, Lord we thank you for your word tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Ruth. 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 Let's, just Let's just read through verses 1 through 6 again. Now it, came now it came to pass, to pass in, the days in the days when the judges ruled, the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land, and a certain man of Bethlehem, Bethlehem Judah, went to, went to dwell in the country of Moab, he and his, he wife, and his wife and his two sons. And the name of that man was Elimelech. The name of his wife was Naomi. And the names of his two sons were Mahalon and Kilion, Ephrathites of Bethlehem Judah. And they went to the country of Moab and remained there. Then, then, there's always, there's a, always then. a then, Elimelech, Elimelech died. died. Naomi's, Naomi's husband, and she left, and, she left, and when she, she, was she was left with her two, with her two sons. sons. So, that was, so that was hard enough. And then verse 4 says, says, Now they took wives of the women of, the women of Moab. The name, the name of one was Orpah, and the name, and the name of the other was Ruth. And they dwelt, and they dwelt there about ten years. Then, then Mahalon and, and Kilion also, also died. died. So the, so the woman survived, survived her two sons and her husband's husband. man. man that's, brutal. that's brutal. That's a huge, that's a huge loss. loss. Then, she then she arose with her daughters-in-law daughters that, that, that she might return from the country, from the country of Moab, of Moab for, she for she had heard in the country of Moab, of Moab that the Lord had visited his people by giving them, giving them bread. bread. And that's, and that's where we left off last week in the introduction. What I like to consider the Hebrew version of Cinderella here, Here we see, we see uh, a young woman who comes from a cursed land. Ruth, Ruth. Her, her name means friendship or friend. Or friend. And it's and interesting when we look at metaphorically how the church uh, and Israel kind of, we kind of see this thing, uh, Christ in the church. And, and something I want to suggest to you in regards to the things that and uh, uh, Ruth, is, Ruth going is going to share later, and I'm going to share, gonna share some things about the church there. there. But as you know, as you know we talked about this in review. Moab, Moab means what? No, Moab, no, Moab means wasted. wasted. Okay, it was party, it was party land. land. They were wasted, man. man. Okay, that was, okay that was Moab. Now, she's now she soon, soon to meet this wealthy prince, prince by the name of Boaz. Boaz. His, name His name, interestingly enough, means fleetness, which means a man... Ad, in, in advancing years, an older man, but fast and light-footed. He was, uh, he was, uh, kinda he's kind of like Larry, like Larry you, know, you know, just more advanced, more advanced in years, guy, but the guy, guy actually, he, he can like run like a 17-year-old. It's amazing. But, uh, but uh, what's, interesting, what's interesting is just a little test for you. There's another, there's another Boaz, Boaz who can tell me where you might, where you find, might that. find that. 
There's another, There's Boaz, another Boaz in the Bible. In the Bible. Yes. Yes, the pillar. The pillar. Solomon's, Solomon's. One, one of the names of Solomon's pillar. Yep. 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 So, uh, so uh, now in the now story, in the story of, course, of course, as I said last no week, there's no magic pumpkin, and Ruth, and Ruth doesn't, get doesn't, get doesn't get taken to the ball. To the ball. But, the story but the story teaches us of this, of this really, really true love, love loyalty, and just a beautiful, a beautiful, beautiful human, human love, love as, well as, as well as God's grace and redemption through working through it. And, uh, and uh, again, again, as I said, it reflects of Christ in the church metaphorically. And, uh, and uh, as, you know, as you know, the Jewish people read this every, every Pentecost. Pentecost. They read, they read through this book. book. And, and uh, but, they but they actually read different books, different books at, different at different feasts, and it's, and it's kind of cool, cool. And I thought I would just give these to you. They read Song, they read Song of Solomon during, Solomon during uh, Passover, Passover, which I thought, which I thought was interesting. interesting. So they'll read so that. that. They read, they read uh, Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes during Tabernacles, during Tabernacles which is up and coming Sukkot. Sukkot. Then they read, then they read Esther, Esther during, Purim. during Purim. Now, this is not necessarily a one of the Lord's feasts, but this was a kind of like a traditional feast because of the celebration of of what happened with Esther. Then you have Lamentations is read during the ninth of Av. Now, why is that? Well, it's interesting because it's two different anniversaries. And both, and both of them had to do with their temple, temple the, destruction the destruction of their temple. The first, the first destruction of the temple by the Babylonians, the second one by the Romans, the Romans both, on both on Av 9. So this, so this they read, they read or they, or they uh, read the uh, book of Lamentations. It's sort of like R 9 11, where we commemorate and weep over the loss of of our loved ones or people who were lost during 9-11. It's the same thing with them in regards to the temple, the destruction of the temple. Uh, also, Hanukkah is another one which came during the time of the Maccabees. Numbers in Zechariah read, and uh, it's also known. Now, the, one of the things in these feasts, they have a bunch of names, so sometimes it can get a little confusing. Hanukkah is also the Feast of Dedication. Jesus attended it, it appears to be so, in John chapter 10, Fe uh, feast of, uh, or the Feast of Lights, it's also known as. So, and that, that if you read in 2 Maccabees 8, if you have an uh, Apocrypha, if you want to read up on the history of the Maccabean revolt, it's there for you. If you want to check it out, it's pretty fascinating. So, here we are. Now, there's a famine in the land, and uh, they're living in Bethlehem, Judah, or the house of bread in praise. That's what those names mean. Elimelech means my God is king, and he is married to Naomi, pleasantness or attractiveness. So Elimelech gets a little bit uh, agitated and worried. There's famine in the land. God's judgment was on the land, as you know, in the book of Judges, and you read what's going on there. The, the country was kind of up and down. Up and down. Uh, sometimes it did good. Sometimes it did evil in the sight of the Lord. More so in the latter. But every once in a while there'd be a time of peace. But at this time they're being judged. And there's, so there's famine in the land. God promised that would happen in Leviticus. So Elimelech goes, you know, I'm the head of the home. My God is king. And I'm going to move my family to wasted. I'm going to go to a place where there's waste. It will, now, it's interesting, we don't necessarily think that way when we think we're going to move out of anxiety or fear, whatever it might be. We often don't think of it as waste until after the fact. Man, that was a waste. That was a waste of time. And it's usually because we were making decisions based on how we felt or how a situation was going. And we weren't really being led by the Lord. We were being led by our fears and anxieties. And so he moves to wasted the literal wash pot, as Psalm says, the toilet bowl spiritually for anybody who went there. And Elimelech and both his sons die there. Because when you go to the land of waste, anything bad can happen. And so scripture doesn't tell us how, but Naomi becomes a widow, so she loses her husband. Ten years later, she loses both her sons. Man, that is brutal. That is brutal. I've seen people, mahalon, which is interesting, means weak 
or sickly. Kilion means pining or wasted. And it could mean that these young men were sickly. They just were not well. They were born sick and maybe they remained sick. They didn't have medication like we do today. I don't know. I'm just guessing. But with names like that, it doesn't sound like the births were very exciting. Uh, these kids were pretty sick. And so they grew up and maybe they died of natural causes because of their sickness or they were just killed, but we don't know how. So this leaves um, Naomi devastated. Listen now, think of you moms and your wife and your mother. You've lost your husband. You've lost your children. Whew. Just think of that. She's disillusioned. And can you blame her, really? Can you blame her? And we're going to find out she's really, she's uh, embittered. She goes, I don't want to be Naomi anymore. I don't feel like Naomi. I want to be Mara. I want to be bitter. And she had reason to be bitter in a sense. But we're going to see something I want to challenge in, in regards to her story. But all this stuff had gone on. Hope, all hope was lost. And guys, <laughs> I've learned this. In the years that I've known the Lord, that when everything seems lost, God is getting ready to move. Every single time. It seems like, Lord, when is this going to happen? When is this going to end? And then suddenly it happens. And it's like, whoa, slow down, Lord. He's going to move. And I was thinking about that. Remember the Red Sea? The Lord brings them to the Red Sea and they have no way out. Okay. What had to happen? The Red Sea had the part. Jesus tells us boys, and he goes, hey, boys, I'm going to die. Wait a minute. You've been our rabbi for three and a half years, and you've been teaching us about the kingdom of God. What do you mean you have to die? He goes, don't worry. I'll send the spirit. But they didn't get it. So they were, that's why, you know, you hear in uh, John 14, don't be troubled. If you believe in me, believe, you know, if you believe in God, you believe also in me. In my father's house are many mansions. Just abide, if, I, if, if you abide in me, I'll abide in you. It'll, it'll be okay. We'll make our abode with you. It's going to be all right. But in their thinking, they're going, okay, Jesus just died on the cross, right? Okay, now, when you see somebody die, that's usually it, right? For, for any other time, when someone dies, that's it. So for them, it was hopeless. There was no way, no way out. So... Uh, when they hear that, it's interesting. And now I'm thinking uh, even in our own culture today, and I'm hearing it a lot from people and, 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 and from a lot of Christians too. It's like, oh, it's all hope is lost. They're redefining marriage. You know, our kids are being taught uh, liberal stuff in schools. But man, the world is going to hell in a handbasket. This is it. It's all hopeless. Listen, whenever you get to that point, I believe the Lord's getting ready to do what? to part the Red Sea, and to roll that stone. Just always keep that in mind, because when things, you're going, things couldn't get any worse, you can be like Naomi and be tempted to become bitter or become better. And so that's going to be the challenge for us tonight. Our God he is an awesome God, there's no doubt about it, but I also believe our God is a last moment God. <laughs> He loves working in the last moment. Just when you, because then we have faith. It's impossible to please God without faith, right? We please God by our faith. But we want to give up because we don't feel like something's not working. And we don't feel, and it's all about our feelings. When everything seems hopeless and you feel like you're losing the battle, I believe that's when the Lord wants to step in. Besides, Jesus told us, even in our day, he goes, when you start to see all these things going on in the world, he goes, just look up. Your redemption draws near. He didn't say get bummed out. He didn't say be all dejected and embittered about your situation. He said, just look up. Keep your eyes on me. Watch and pray. He didn't say watch and protest. He didn't say watch and complain. He said watch and pray. Talk to the Lord. Talk to me about it. Now, I can personally go to the Lord and say, Lord, I'm upset about this. I need help on this. That's fine.
But to go to one another and we're complaining about this or ra ragging on that or the other, that's just, it's just, it's, it's bitter. It doesn't taste good. The Bible says, taste the Lord and see that he is good. And the way they're going to taste the Lord is by talking and listening to you. That's the way it ought to be. So start looking up. So picture the scene. Naomi is beside herself with grief, worry. She hears the report, though, that the famine has ended. So she decides, I should go home. And apparently the rain had returned. there, And it always does, by the way, when you're in a dry time. The rain will return. The fruit will come. Okay? But sometimes you feel like you're walking in dryness. Oh, I hate it to the core. But you know what always comes out? All the bad stuff that I didn't know was in there <coughs> during my dry time when I wasted time doing this or doing that out of my own desperation. I believe that, you know, she's thinking, man, you know, there's relatives there, and it would be bad. Let's just go back. I, I, I need to get back home. Maybe she was missing it. She'd been gone for over 10 years, and she heard, you know, there was only 30 miles away, so it wasn't that far. And so she was probably, you know, they probably had people coming in and out. Hey, how's Bethlehem? Oh, man, it's rocking, man. It's been raining there. It's fruitful, and. All this stuff, and she's going, oh, maybe I should go back there. I hate it here. I lost everything here. So, but that meant that judgment had stopped upon the nation, and peace had been restored. So I was thinking, oh, well, this could be around the time of Ehud or Deborah or Gideon when they were ruling as a judge, a righteous judge, and peace came upon the land. So Naomi had to change directions, and I think this is a Wonderful lesson on repentance. Re repentance means to simply change, do a 180 and change your direction. And I think the thing with Naomi is that we're going to discover is she wants to go back, but she's going back for provision. Going back not because she misses the Lord, but because there's food there. And I think this is one of the reasons why the Lord's going to bless her socks off with a friend by the name of Ruth. So, as Jesus spoke of the prodigal son, remember? When he came to himself, he goes, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough to spare and I perish with hunger? She goes, I'm going to go back to the house of bread. So, like Abraham in Egypt, remember he was there? He need to get out of Dodge, get out of Egypt, go back to what he was called to do. Jacob with Laban, he needed to leave Laban, and go back to Bethel. Naomi's decision was right, but I think as we'll, we're going to hear, and I want to challenge you, that her, her motive was wrong. And that is that she was interested primarily in the food and not in fellowship with her God. Not yet. It's going to happen. And I think this is something I want to, tell you that in the time that we're embittered about something it takes time and the lord is very patient with us to work on that and he usually sends a friend a ruth our to our, our way and I, and we'll kind of see that as it unfolds so she's returning to her land but she's really not returning to her lord but the lord is so patient with her even as he is with us now watch this, verse 7. Therefore she went out from the place where she was, Moab, and her two daughters-in-law were with her. And they went on the way to return to the land of Judah, the land of praise. Good thing to do. When you start feeling like your life is a waste, man, go praise the Lord. Go spend time in praise. That's the best thing to do. So Naomi, Ruth, and Orpah, they begin their 30-mile journey from Moab to Bethlehem. But somewhere along the way, Naomi goes, what am I doing? She's understandably self-centered at this point because of her loss, loss of her husband. She's probably missing her husband terribly, probably traveling this uh, particular road, remembering the last time that she did. 
her husband with us, with her sons with her. So she's like, and she's got her two daughters-in-law with her. And she starts kind of thinking, I, oh man, why should I, why should they leave their place, their familiar place to come with me? I'm just a loser. I'm a jinx. I'm, you know, she's thinking all these things. I know I'm speculating, but the idea is this is how I read the word. I like to bring some life into it because I know how I would feel. If I was Naomi, I, I, at least I would know the emotions I might be going through. I'm too old. I'm a widow. I'm too old to remarry. I'm too old to bear children. And here, Ruth and Orpah, they're going with me. They're destined to a life of seclusion with me. They, why would they want to be with me? See, when you're in that bitterness and that depression, then it's just like it's not worth anybody's time to be with me. So why would they want to be with me? So she's kind of in that frame of mind. So she's compelled, verse 8. Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, go, return each to her mother's house. Okay, go to your mom's house. The Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. And the Lord grant that you might find rest each in the house of her husband. So she kissed them and they lifted up their voices and wept. So they could tell the eyes were watering. They're all weepy. And she's going, hey, girls, you need to go back. But the problem is she was saying, go back to your wasteland. Because she was not thinking biblical thoughts. She was thinking emotional thoughts. You know, you don't want to come with me. But they said no. And notice it says they said. Not just Ruth, but they both. No, surely we will return with you to your people. And this is where I kind of think Naomi's kind of blowing it a little bit because she's saying, I mean, instead of being kind of where she's at, you guys just need to leave me be and go back to the wasteland. She should, she should be saying, hey, come to the house of bread in a place of praise. Come with me. I can't wait to get you there because that's better than wasteland. But she kind of didn't. She's encouraging her daughters-in-law to go back to the false gods. And that cause, and, and what, again, what causes her to say this, and the reason I'm saying this because she's going to say it here in a bit, was bitterness. Bitterness. Just a couple passages I want to quote to you from the New Testament because you and I can fall into the same issues as Naomi. Maybe it's not the actual death of your spouse or your children, but maybe there's just death in your life and you've become embittered and you start blaming God and you get sort of ticked off at God a little bit. And so Paul warns believers, okay, in Ephesians 4, 31 and 32, let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, you mean we can have that as Christians? Uh-huh. Okay, evil speaking be put away from you with all malice and be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God and Christ forgave you. And then a very important passage in Hebrews 12, 14 through 15. Pursue peace with all or all people and pursue holiness. Pursue wholeness without which no one will see the Lord. Looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble. And watch this. And by this, many become defiled. My bitterness will affect you. My bitterness can defile you. Your, your bitterness can defile me. And, and we are warned in the scripture, beware of that. Don't let it take root because it'll try. And all you need is a few hard times and some why is me and woe is me. And, and even if they're, Real, like the loss of a spouse or loss of your children or whatever. You have real reason to say, I justifiably feel I can be bitter about this. So 
The Bible says beware lest a root of bitterness spring up and then you start defiling others with your bitterness. This is what Naomi was doing, sad to say. You guys, go back to your wasteland. Verse 11 then says, Naomi said, turn back, my daughters. Why do you want to go with me? Are there still sons in my womb that they may be your husbands? Turn back, my daughters. Go, for I'm too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, if I should say I had a a husband tonight and should bear sons, are you really going to wait till they're grown up? Really? Would you restrain yourself from having husbands? No, my daughters, for it grieves me very much for your sakes that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. Now, I want you to notice something. In our culture, we have lost the value of family and the value of name. We've lost it. The value, the the family value, but also the importance of our names. In the Jewish culture, man, that was everything. That was everything. And she had lost everything. She had lost her name. She had also lost her name. She lost her sons. She had lost her husband. And so she's really feeling like everything is against her. And I think sometimes when we read passages like this in the Bible, it's hard for us to relate because our our family system and family values in our country are so broken up. We have six different names and, you know, it's just three different dads and five different moms and, you know, different uh, families around the country are struggling with just keeping a family unit together. So the tragedy is that for Naomi is she wasn't presenting the God of Israel in a positive way. A positive way. God's against me. He hurt me. I don't know why, but he must be against me. Now, we don't say that. We'll usually say, well, God is, you know, I'm I'm coming through. I don't know where God is at in all this, but he's going to get me through or whatever. But there's just that, that slight misrepresentation of God's goodness, regardless of, of what I'm going through in my life. So she blames God for the sorrow and the pain rather than saying, I do feel this way, but God is the resource of my joy. I don't know where it is right now, but I know he's the resource, and I'm going back to the house of bread to get it because I've lost it. See, there's no confession in the heart of Naomi. There's no confessing like, Lord, I'm, I'm bitter. I'm, I'm, I'm blowing it. She was, she was glad to tell people uh, in a horizontal way, but there was no vertical of her bitterness. She wasn't dealing with it with the Lord. And, you know, so it was, it was really tough. So she says, it grieves me very much for your sakes that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. I'm to blame for my, our trial, so why remain with me? I'm no good. And I believe had Naomi been walking more closely with the Lord at this time, Orpah would have come, no doubt. And she would have brought two trophies of grace instead of one. Now, I don't know what would have happened had Orpah come. But it's interesting that Orpah was like, she really doesn't want me to go. And she she went back. But she really wanted to go. But you know what that's like if you're in a family and they say, I want you to go. Get out of here, Joy. I'm not, I'm not worth your, your time. You just go back to what you're used to, man. Go back to your mom or whatever. You're kind of like, oh, okay. And they wept. So Orpah, she wipes her tears. She goes back from where she came from. And it's kind of sad because she really didn't want to. Verse 14, then they lifted up their voices and wept again. And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law. But Ruth clung to her as any friend will. Regardless, that's a true friend. The ones who will hear that negativity and hear that bitterness coming out and God's against me and you've got, you've got a friend right there just clinging to you. I'm not leaving you. No way. So you have Naomi trying to cover up 
Orpah had given up, and Ruth was prepared to stand up. She refused to listen to her mother-in-law's pleas and uh, followed her sister uh, or to even follow Orpah because she could have been, well, maybe I should go with Orpah. She can't, I don't want her alone on the road, you know, whatever. But, you know, here's the thing about Ruth. She, obviously, they were close. They've been together at least 10 years. And she saw something in Naomi. Remember, her name means pleasant. There was something pleasant about Naomi. She was an attractive. She was just a, a beaming personality. And, she, and Ruth knew this wasn't the true Naomi. She goes, oh. She saw the years of loyalty and dedication and love. And it just made her impossible. There is no way I am leaving my mother. No way. And it's the moment that all history would remember as we read. Verse 15 says, look, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Isn't that exciting? Back to waste and to uh, Chemosh, right? Return after your sister. She's imploring Ruth to go. But friend, or Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave you or to turn back from following after you. For wherever you go, I will go. And wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. When you die, I will die. And there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me and more also if anything but death parts you and me. Whew, powerful. Verse 18, and when she saw that she was determined to go with her, she says, okay. What a statement. And I think this is a statement that truly Christians can say to the Lord for their love for the Lord, but also the God of Israel, which is why we should support Israel. Your people shall be my people. Not I'm going to excuse them out of the picture. Ruth had experienced, listen, now keep in mind, Ruth and Orpah also were widows. Okay, they lost their husbands too. So they had reason to weep. They had reason to experience trials and disappointments. But I think instead of blaming God, Ruth looked past Naomi's bitterness and she trusted in the God of Israel. In essence, it was sort of her, her uh, conversion to say, I, your people shall be my people. I want to know the God of Israel. And Ruth had come to know the Lord in that way. And the Lord had a beautiful surprise for her and with his people. And she was going to dwell in the land. Now, I was talking about this last week with Kathy. And she told me something very, very sweet. And I said, you've got to share this. Can we get this mic on here? Which is why you see this picture before ye. Check, 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 check. check. There we go. Kathy, uh, Kathy's going to share something with us. We stand right here, Kathy. On August 12th, 1967, Larry and I were married. Will you come here, please? Fifty years ago, last month, Larry and I were married. And thank you. I had heard at many weddings the bride would say this to the husband. And it, in those days, we mostly used the King James Version. And so I memorized it, and I told Larry at our wedding, and this is what I said. Larry, entreat me not to leave thee, nor forsake from following thee, return from following after thee. For whither thou goest, I will go. Where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people will be my people, and thy God, my God. Where I die, where you die, there will I die, and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if aught but death part thee and me.
sweet. And it's true because you showed me uh, your burial plots where you guys are going to be buried together. Oh, that is just, that's the best. Amen. Amen. Well, you guys are a great witness to love and marriage, I'll tell you, and, and many other ways as well. And I really, really appreciate that. You see, for Kathy, it was, uh, you know, we talked about this too. It's like contextually, it was really Ruth talking to Naomi. But you can take that and really apply it to these situations, and they're just as powerful, just as rich. She's just sharing her commitment and love to Larry, and it's real. It's real. I love the picture there. It's great. I love it. Uh, so Ruth is doing the same thing here, but she's just saying, man, I, I, I'm going to I'm gonna hold on to you. Naomi, I'm not going to give up on you. And uh, uh, yeah, I, I know what you're going through as far as what you're feeling, and, I, and I, I'm just, and so I'm sure they had weeping and hugs after she said that. And verse 19 says, now the two of them went until they came to Bethlehem. And it happened when they had come to Bethlehem that all the city was excited because of them. So obviously, at least it seems to me that they sort of were expecting them. If all the city was excited to see them. Now, granted, this was a small village at the time. I don't know how many people would have been there, but word had gotten out that Naomi was coming home. And so... So they're all excited to see her, this little place. It, but it had been about 10, 15 years or so since, since these residents had seen her. And uh, obviously, within this time, she had aged. But I'll tell you what, bitterness will put a few more years on you and take away the sweetness and take away the countenance of that attractiveness and that pleasantness that... Naomi apparently used to have because they said, is this Naomi? Is this her? Now listen, they remembered her leaving happy. She's coming back looking pretty sullen, pretty solemn, pretty bummed out, pretty depressed. And then verse 20 says, she said to them, now listen, this is sort of like a, hey, what's going on? Uh, hi, you know, she goes, don't call me Naomi. Call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt bitterly with me. I went out full, and the Lord has brought me home again empty. Why do you call me Naomi, since the Lord testified against me, and the Almighty has afflicted me? Wow. Last time they saw her, it's true. She was with Elimelech and her two sons. Naomi was pleasant. She was attractive. She had a purpose. She was a wife. She was a mother of two sons. She comes back alone. And she feels like the Lord has come against her for some reason. And think of this excitement of these people so glad to see her, wanting to greet her, wanting to love on her, and she wouldn't let them. Don't call me pleasant. Don't call me attractive. Call me bitter because that's what I am. And I don't know if you've ever been to a party <laughs> where everyone's having the greatest time and somebody come mopes in and bums the whole group out. <laughs> Have you ever been part of that where you're just like, oh, my goodness. I mean, they just totally, what do we call them? Wet blankets, right? What did you say, Sharon? Eeyore. <laughs> Oh, it's me. Oh, I can't get it enough. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm pretty good at that. I don't even need to practice that. You see, here's the lesson. Listen, I know we're going to go through tough times. But if people are excited to see you, be excited back. That's where you have to tru truly die to yourself, suck it up, and you might feel fake, but that's where the Bible says, put on the Lord Jesus. Okay? When I am bummed, 
when I am blue and someone comes up to me and says, hey, Jeff, how's it going? I'll tell him it's not so good, but, you know, God is good. He's going to see us through. And and I don't try to throw this big wet blanket. Oh, you just, oh, and this and, oh, and then, you know, they're excited to see you, especially if they hadn't seen you for a while. I mean, I think it would have been a real bummer had I gone to see Josh. I hadn't seen him in like five years, and then I go go see him over there. And how's it going? Oh, man, it's just horrible. I feel like the Lord's against me, man. It'd be, it would have just bummed Josh out, Right? So I think this is a good thing. Don't bum people out with your problems, but accept the people. They're, they're smiling at you. Hey, it's so good to see you, Larry. How are you? You know, you're dying inside. You're going, hey, I'm, I'm good, you know. God, you know. I know sometimes we feel fake. We say God is good, but he is good, and he always is good. So you're not lying when you say that. When you say everything is good, that's a lie. Everything is not good, but God is always good, and so... Sometimes it can be tough to do, but, uh, and, and again, when I think of Naomi, her grief is speaking, right? You might know some people right now and grieving, and you see them when they're up and when they're down, and you can see that the, it's the grief that's speaking, and uh, when Naomi was talking about this idea of I went out full, she was ta wasn't talking about food. She was talking about her family. I left with a husband and two sons, and now I've come back empty. The Lord must have something against me. But that wasn't true at all. In Jewish culture, family is bigger than a full stomach. But keep in mind that Naomi's identity had been completely stripped. She couldn't be the wife or the mother. That was complete. And that was a woman's identity at that time, is to be a wife and a mother and to prepare those children. And those children were going to take over. Well, that's all gone. That's been wiped out. But remember, every time it seems hopeless, who's going to move in? The Lord is. He's going to roll away the stone He's going to open the Red Sea. And that's what we're going to see in the story. Naomi is still struggling with it, but she has a friend that sticks closer than a sister. Right? She's got Ruth there. Ruth is going to help her through. But then the Lord's going to use Ruth to bring Naomi around. It's so cool how the Lord does that. Verse 22, so Naomi returned. And Ruth the Moabite is her daughter-in-law with her who returned from the country of Moab. And they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. Okay, now the barley harvest is normally around in the spring uh, at pa Passover time. Okay, and then 50 days from Passover is Pentecost. That's when the wheat harvest happens. They're both planted at the same times, but barley grows a little faster. So they're planted in the fall prior. Barley and wheat are planted in the fall uh, fall prior. So they'd be planting now for next for the wheat and barley harvest that's up and coming. Um, and then, uh, so at this particular time, so it's important that we kind of know this is the beginning of the barley harvest. So this would be really in the area of Passover, because the har the beginning of the of the barley harvest. Um, and uh, you'll notice, too, if you look at Ruth, uh, uh, chapter 2, verse 23, and we'll look at this next week, that this, uh, uh, let's see, yeah, let's see, it's 23. Yeah, let's see, 23, 23, 23. It says, so she stayed close by the young woman of Boaz to glean until the end of the barley harvest and wheat harvest. So now you know the basis of time. It was between Passover and Pentecost. And so now you kind of know the time of when this was all going on. Um, we'll, we'll get into uh, chapter 2 next week. Um, and I think what we're going to do is I just want to 
Uh, I saw Larry here. I said, Larry, I didn't know you were coming. I said, I would have told you to bring your shofar because, as you know, next week is Rosh Hashanah on Wednesday at sundown, Jewish New Year. But you guys all know the 23rd and what's supposed to happen, right? What's being said is what's supposed to happen. When it, guys, when it comes to prophetic scriptures, your best bet is not to buy a book to find out about it. Your best bet is to study the feasts to find out about it. Because Revelation, you know, this whole idea of Revelation, the lining of the planets, it's all interesting and all. Uh, but the timing is all off. It's, 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 it's just, you know, if it happens, great. I can say, well, I guess I was wrong, you know. But, but it's just like we, we saw this with the Shemitah. We saw this with a, a blood red moon, all this stuff. And what it does is it builds up disappointment rather than excitement. Because we know that the Lord could come back at any moment, at any time, whenever he wants. Okay? But we also know that the Lord has laid out his feast, not the Jewish feast, but his feast, to show us, to give us an idea of what he's doing. And so if we're going to fix our eyes on his coming, use the Lord's feast to do it. Okay? Passover, as you know, are three different events. Okay, speak of his death, Passover lamb, burial, the feast of unleavened bread. Remember, they hide the piece of bread, uh, the middle piece. And then you have the resurrection, which is the feast of first fruits of the barley harvest on the first day of the week. Okay, that's Passover. So his death, burial, resurrection. Obviously, that's been fulfilled. Okay. Pentecost, of course, commemorates all commemorated the giving of the holy law, which is the time of the wheat harvest. All right? And this is the only time there was a command to, to make loaves of leavened bread. And I'm told, and I might be off on this, but I'm told it's two loaves, and they said that it was representing Torah, the law, the two tablets. The problem with that for me is it was made of leaven. And, and I've asked some guides and stuff like that. Leaven's a picture of sin. I mean, when you look at throughout the Bible, it seems to point to sin every time. So I thought, well, what happened at Pentecost? In Acts chapter 2. Holy Spirit came down upon the leavened Jew and Gentile. The ideas of those two loaves representing Jew and Gentile becoming one in Christ, both leavened, and the Holy Spirit coming down. Yes, it commemorated the giving of the law, which does what? Drives us to Christ. And now we're unleavened. Our sins are forgiven and forgotten. Those events have been fulfilled. But the one event that hasn't been fulfilled is tabernacles or Sukkot. Okay? This is the thing that has yet to happen. So every fall, I'm excited because I'm thinking, could it be this year? Could it be this year? Now we're seeing the Bible says, look at the signs. You know, look at the star. You know, look at the seasons and look at the sun. Look at the moon. All these different things are signs. We don't worship the signs. You know, we don't try to follow the signs. We don't write books about the signs. We just go, hey, there's a sign. It's it's telling us that the the uh, time is near. And so, Tabernacles commemorates three different events. You have the, the Jewish New Year, which is also, again, there's a lot of names, Day of Trumpets, okay? And I've asked Larry, I said ne maybe next uh, week you could do that, Larry? We'll do the different uh, calls of the trumpets. Uh, so you have the Day of Trumpets. It's, it's the Jewish New Year, okay? And, uh, but it was also a call to repentance with the shofar. And uh, next week I'll have Larry do, there's four different ones, and he'll blurt out each one. But the last one is the Takiya uh, Gedola, is it? Takiya Gedola, and it means the last trump. Does that sound familiar? Okay, so we see the day of trumpets, and again, 
I'm I'm only going by what I have seen in the previous uh, feasts that have been uh, fulfilled to see, okay, first you have the Day of Trumpets, and then you have 10 days later, Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, a time of national repentance for Israel, and then you have the Feast of Booths, okay? So... I have found that for me personally, and I think uh, with Calvary Chapel, we believe in a pre-trib rapture, and it will happen at the last trump, the last shofar. Okay, now there's lots of ideas as to when that last trump will happen, and that's between you and the Lord. God bless you. But for me, I believe it's going to happen before the tribulation kicks in because that's where God's going to be able to focus on the nation of Israel and tabernacle speaks of the millennial kingdom. Okay, so you have the rapture. God's now the rapture's out and that's taken out. We'll look at that in Romans chapter 11. Then you have God dealing specifically and Israel's getting ready. I mean, there's all kinds of stuff going on in Syria right now. It's like, ah! It's, it's like exciting, but God's, you know, and we have Netanyahu who's reading the Bible with the sun every day. It's like, hey, man, he could be not one of the 144,000, but he could certainly be one who uh, is involved in, uh, yeah, I don't know if he's a born-again believer. Do you think he's a born-again believer? Yes. Yeah, you think so? Uh, I hope so, but what I'm saying is, is that there is, you know he's he's in a good place, and I just really, uh, I just really believe that that would unleash everything. You get the Christians out of the way, God can now work with uh, uh, Israel once again. And it's neat that we're starting to study through the minor prophets on Thursday mornings, because there are a lot of the scriptures and passages are in there to talk about it. But then you have Israel coming their time of repentance. Salvation comes to the Jewish people, and then you have the millennial kingdom being ushered in. So that's how I see the Feast of Tabernacles. What's interesting about the Feast of Tabernacles, remember you have Passover. There are all three feasts within one. That's why it's just called Passover. Passover, unleavened bread, and then right at the first day of the week, you have the first, you have the Feast of First Fruits. So they're all within each other. And that's exactly what happened when Jesus died on the cross, buried, rose again, all within Passover. Pentecost, one moment, one, you know, the giving of the law, but then the birth of the church. The law drives us to Christ. So that happened just in that sense. Well, the uh, Feast of Tabernacles are three separate events. They're not all within. So you have the rapture, then you have a time span before National repentance of Israel, time span before the millennial kingdom. So I'm just saying. It's kind of interesting to think about. So go ahead and read chapter 2, and we'll get back to our story. But I want to make that a side note, and uh, we'll uh, talk a little bit more about it next week, and we'll do some uh, blurting on the shofar. Larry will do it for us. That'll be great. You guys have been there during Sukkot. And it's all, you can hear shofars everywhere, can't you? Yeah. Oh, that's such a sweet sound. Such a sweet sound. <laughs>